All right, welcome back to episode two of Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop. Uh, today, like last week, we'll be talking to Sean Kitchen out there in Harrisburg. Uh, thanks for joining us, Sean. Yep, it's great being back. Excellent. And each week, basically what we're doing here is we're giving you a little peek about what's happening on the ground in uh, Pennsylvania's capital, Harrisburg, what's coming up in terms of legislation that matters to working people and activists that are out there. Um, and then a little peek behind the curtain, so to speak, about uh, kind of life and times in Harrisburg and uh, what's actually happening among the politicians and the lobbyists and people on the street there. So, uh, Sean, so give us a little lowdown about some of the things you've been covering this past week. Okay, so um, late last week, um, I wrote an article about some of the police issues that have been going on in Pennsylvania and some of the legislation that's been introduced to combat the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and communities of color standing up to police violence and police abuses. Um, last year, there was a high-profile shooting in Philadelphia involving a police officer, and um, Commissioner Ramsey chose to release the officer's name within three days. That was, that sparked outrage by the Philadelphia Fraternal Order of Police. Mm -hmm. And there was, a leg there was legislation introduced by Representative White to make it illegal for officers or for public officials to release the names of officers involved in shootings or use of force cases um, within 72 hours. It, they would have to wait until an official investigation has been concluded, mm -hmm. which can take a while. You know, if, it's a, if there's a high profile case, that police departments really don't want to get out to the public. You know, almost could uh, promote like covering up crimes or covering up incidents. No, exactly. And you, and you write in your piece uh, that, uh, quote, the ACLU of Pennsylvania believes that these bills are aimed at communities of colors for speaking out against police misconduct and is nothing more than, quote, petty political backlash by powerful people for the rise of Black Lives Matter. Um, so talk us through a little bit about that, about ACLU's position on that and how they see the connection being about kind of going after groups like Black Lives Matter. Well, specifically in Philadelphia, um, there was this high-profile instance. The name of the shooting, the name of the victim is not getting, it's not, it's not on the tip of my tongue, but this happened in the winter of 2014. Uh, Commissioner Ramsey decided to release the officer's name involved in the shooting, and this led to a lot of outrage in Northeast Philadelphia, which is where the, uh, which is where the person was shot, the, the victim was shot a shot and killed by the police mm -hmm. officers. So the Longcrest area of Northeast Philadelphia, which is, it's changing demographically. It used to be a predominantly white neighborhood, but it's becoming more black for some of the people up there to uh, realize, to accept. And in that area, uh, just around that area, State Representative Martino White represents that area. Mm -hmm. um, and that area, Northeast Philadelphia, going further out, is pretty much, that's where all the police officers live you know, in gotcha. Northeast Philadelphia, in the white part of the city. Mm -hmm. And she has heavy connections to the Philadelphia Fraternal Order of Police. They helped get her elected. Her election party was held at their lodge. And this is sort of something that happened in their backyard because a lot of African-American and a lot of Latino members of the community were really angry about the shooting that happened. And some of the confrontations got pretty heated between the public and the police department in, in the days and months following that, um, following that shooting. Mm -hmm. So do you think that uh, you also mentioned in your piece that uh, both Martina White and John Rafferty, people who have sponsored this legislation, um, are facing contested elections come to coming up. So you, you see this legislation that they're putting forward uh, as an attempt to get some traction? Um, in the I think it's also election? a fundraising point, too, mm -hmm. you know, that they'll that they'll be at their backs for the, um, the, the police department. Senator Rafferty, who's from Bucks County, he's running for... Um, He's running for attorney general, and he's pretty much the only Republican on the ticket. There is someone else running there. It's Kathleen Kane's former um, chief of staff or former spokesperson. But he's running as a Republican, but he's not going to win. He doesn't have the name of recognition. And Rafferty will pretty much tie up the nomination on primary night for the Republican ticket. And, but his bill is similar to Martina White's, but it adds an enforcement mechanism. It will charge public officials or police captains with a second degree misdemeanor for releasing their names to the public. Man, which is so, pretty which is so, pretty out there. So what do you think the effect of that's gonna be? Uh, it's, it's a silencing effect. Um, one, you're allowing things to happen within police institutions without the public knowing. Uh, the two organizations against this are the ACLU and the Pennsylvania News Media Association. Mm -hmm. On the ACLU, we obviously know who they are, but the Pennsylvania News Media Association, 
they're an organization, an industry group that represents uh, editors and newsrooms across the state. And what they advocate for is open records, government transparency. And even though this doesn't have to do with the open records laws, they still see this as an attack against uh, freedom of the press and government transparency. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, you brought up the the incidents with Ramsey releasing this one name, and it's almost like you're starting to see uh, some splits within the ranks of the police too, as well. About you know, there's you have some officers who've come out, for example, in favor of body cameras um, and more transparency, and it seems that there's other organizations, other parts of the police force are looking to kind of lock things down um, and to kind of you know raise that you know raise that line of secrecy. Uh, that much higher. Yeah, I mean, you gotta think about it. I mean, these people, they don't like being criticized in public. They don't like people have pointing cameras at them. And since we've gotten cell phone cameras, we've seen more of these abuses come to light. And one of the things that the um, News Media Association touches on in their letters sent before Martinez White Bill was voted in front of the House was what exactly is use of force? Mm-hmm. It could be using your car to run someone over. It can be using your car to stop someone who's on foot. You can. It could be kicking someone in the face, using um, a taser, using pepper spray indiscriminately. And say, if someone indiscriminately gets pepper sprayed, the officer's name would not be released until after the investigation. And what happens if nothing comes out of the investigation? My opinion, um, you know, I'm going on the record saying it, but my opinion is it would cause something that, w- that would happen in Chicago with Laquan McDonald getting right. shot. Right. And and it's, right almost, it, it's almost like it, it's, it has to be in cases that are so egregious that um, that it's so abundantly clear that this was a case of murder that the name would, would be released. So we have no way of publicly being able to identify patterns of, say, excessive use of force among police officers or particular police officers, I guess. Exactly. All right, cool. The, the other piece that I know you're working on, you're working on uh, some big some stuff coming up with minimum wage. Uh, you're, they're uh, attempted to push to raise the minimum wage in Pennsylvania a little bit. Talk us through that. So um, the minimum wage has been an issue that's been supporting. You know, we talked about this last week, what Governor Wolf has been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, again, this week, there's going to be more minimum wage stuff on the, um, on the docket. So once the legislators come back this week, pretty much budget season 2016 is underway. This is like the first quarter of the budget season. This is when we have all the fundraisers up and down for Second Street and off the other restaurants. And this is when the lobbying really starts going. Mm-hmm. Today is the 20th annual lobby day for the Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association. They're having a press conference today. They're one of the main organizations holding back raising the minimum wage. And then the Raise the Wage Coalition uh, will be holding a press conference before that on raising the wage to 10, 10 an hour. So there's dueling press conferences going on inside the Capitol today, one at 12, the other one's at one thirty. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the push to raise the minimum wage. I mean, what kind of proposals are we looking at right now? I mean, do we have proposals for, you know, the, the $15, $15 minimum wage? Are we looking at $12, 10? What, what seems there are to be many, um, there are many, um, there are many bills inside the um, House and Senate right now. I think Patty Kim has a $15 an hour minimum wage. State Senator Dalen Leach has a $15 an hour minimum wage, and there's a $12 an hour minimum wage bill out there. Um, 1010 seems like to be the one that they're going for. Mm-hmm. The governor has asked for a 1015 an hour. I guess that's because of inflation increases over the past year when he called for a 1010 an hour minimum wage increase. But there's also ones like Scott Wagner's that's an 875 with a $7 with minimum wage training wage, and then you work your way up to $9 or 950 an hour over a two year period. Good. So has the governor been pushing this then directly and his budget proposal for the next year? Um, I guess so, because last week, uh, Governor Wolf was actually spotted with State Senator Dalen Leach, who was advocating for a $15 minimum wage in uh, somewhere in southeastern PA. Uh, so it seems, nice. like the governor, it seems like Governor Wolf is getting more vocal on this. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, when we come back after a little break, uh, we're going to get into some of the behind the scenes stuff out there in Harrisburg, particular around some of the lobbying that takes place uh, just on the everyday session days uh, when legislators are getting ready to start their political work. There's a whole lot of work that happens before then. And uh, maybe we hear a little bit about what's going to be happening today in the Capitol or minimum wage. Uh, We'll be right back with Sean Kitchen. This is Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop.
All right, we're back with Sean Kitchen. This is Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop. And uh, Sean, I understand today that you're up bright and early. Uh, what the, what were you doing up bright and early? I mean, don't you got the day off today? Yeah, I was up at 7 o'clock this morning, which uh, is something that rarely ever happens on a day off for me. Um, I went to get a picture of Jay Corman this morning, pretty much. Jay Corman? And, you're just a fan? Uh, yeah, I'm a huge fanboy of Senator... Uh, State Senator Corman, the majority leader. I think you know, I, I saw was, a poster in your apartment, right? Did you got that big wall-sized Jake Corman cutout? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about those things in public. <laughs> I thought we were doing behind the scenes. <laughs> we are. So uh, basically, to, this morning I got up. I was out of my apartment by like 7.30 this morning. I uh, grabbed a cup of coffee at Little Amps. Um, I went inside the Hilton Hotel uh, to scout around some of the things that were going on upstairs. Because today was the lobbying day for the Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lobbying Association. Yeah, and for people that don't know or are listening in, who haven't been uh, to the Capitol, like the Hilton is like really, literally just a few blocks uh, from the actual Capitol building. So we're talking very, very close to the Capitol. So anyway, and this is this is where all the breakfasts are held, or a lot of like conferences are held. You know, um, it's really breakfasts. interesting. What do you mean breakfasts? Lobby breakfast with people like you know you have uh, breakfast with Jay Corman and go you know you have people from the chamber and the manufacturers association coming in stuff like that like so whenever there's session days in Harrisburg um, usually you have fundraising breakfasts in the morning and then you have lobby luncheons in the afternoon and then you have stuff at nighttime at the local bars uh, more fundraisers so, so you're basically of, talking about the, the stage is set at the beginning of a session day so you've got the lobbyists that are basically giving the message pretty directly to all the politicians you don't want to bite the hand that literally feeds you every day <laughs> at eight o'clock in the morning eight o'clock in see, the morning like it's right. one thing you know going traveling out of my apartment at the end of the day to go to the bar because you know Harrisburg's still lively. There's still people walking on the thing. It's really like eerie and odd walking down Second Street at like 7:30 in the morning with no cars along the street. No, really little traffic rush hour doesn't start yet, and then it just starts like filling in with like the rats coming out of the hole, going into the different hotels and everything like that. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so I was you know standing outside of the Hilton for about 45 minutes to uh, take a picture of State Senator Jake Corman walking into the hotel just to start off the events with uh, today's minimum wage stuff. So this uh, he was going into the one with the, uh, the restaurant association? Yes, he was going into the restaurant and lodging associations uh, breakfast to uh, give legislative briefings on what's happening in the Senate and what's happening in the House. Um, he was spotted with State Senator John Eichelberger, who is responsible for, we talked about him last week, with the, with the media people. Right. But he's also, he, all, he's also the one that introduced paycheck protection in the Senate over the past couple sessions. So we're, we could see where, which side of their bread is buttered, basically we're saying, and who's doing the buttering from these yeah, events. Exactly, you know, I'm, I'm standing outside, seeing all the usual faces from the Chamber of Business, the Manufacturers Association, your regular Chiefs of Staffs, all that good stuff going on. Like yeah, the, so the lobbyists you see on a daily basis. You get to know them personally after, after a while. Now, is Corman expected to introduce any legislation or anything like this today? Is minimum wage going to be on the floor in the discussions today? No, but today, so basically what's going on today is um, it's not expected to be on the floor. It hasn't moved. It's been sitting in the Senate since last May. It hasn't even gotten a single committee vote yet. It had one hearing, and that's all it's gotten. But um, basically today is the 20th, 28th annual lobby day for the uh, Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lobbying Association on the Hill. So... They're going to be talking about tourism and industry. Well, before that, um, the raised a wage folks, they're going to be talking about waging. They're going to upstage them, hold a counter um, press conference at 12, an hour before that, to talk about raising the minimum wage. So Raise the Wage Coalition. Tell me a little bit about this group. Um, they're pushing for 10 10 an hour. It consists of local unions and organizations throughout the state. Um, one of the groups that's sponsoring today's, today's event is Rock. Restaurant Opportunity um, Center United, the restaurant workers. I forget. I don't have their name right in front of them, but like restaurant, Oppor restaurant opportunity centers. Yes, these are yes. folks that we were talking to out in uh, Harrisburg a couple weeks back for the uh, the Keystone Progressive Summit. Yeah, so they're going to be out here. Um, they are, they're bringing about fifteen of their own folks out here today, and then I think it's going to be like 30, 40 people at the most. So today's just like you know your dueling theater that goes on in the Capitol. On a, on a regular basis, which is pretty interesting to watch the back and forth going on. See who can grab the headlines from who. 
So yeah, that's going to be interesting. So you've got the raise the wage folks are coming out first, and then you're going to have the uh, the restaurant people coming out basically saying, no, 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 poverty wages is perfectly fine. Pretty are much. They, are they expected to actually address the minimum wage question at that the second press conference, the lobbying group? I'm not sure. Um, I am not sure about that. I know like one of the issues that is really important to the lobbying association is uh, keeping the tip minimum wage at two dollars and eighty three cents an hour. Mm -hmm. So it's like one of the things that they've been going against. Um, they put out literature saying a raising the minimum wage would especially hurt the hospitality industry, and it would ex mainly hurt you know single mothers. And they put this out in print. It would hurt like eighteen thousand women compared to twelve thousand men. So they're trying to use this as a, a pay gap, a gender pay gap uh, issue too. That raising the minimum wage would actually hurt more women than men. So you should just keep it at suck it up and keep it at two eighty three an hour. This is, you know, the irony is just dripping in this thing, right? I mean, the fact that they're saying you have the hospitality industry, right? They require people to have like disposable income in order for them to survive, right? So their argument is, therefore, we want to make sure people's wages are low <laughs> so they can't afford to come and support our industry. I mean, this is that's the most insane argument that I could hear over and over again. That that these people come out with saying it's gonna hurt these people, it's gonna hurt the industry. No, it's not gonna hurt the industry. It's actually gonna put money in people's pockets so that they can go and spend it at your ridiculous restaurants. I mean, this is crazy. Exactly. So <laughs> this is this is I'm sorry. I just this this is the kind of stuff that just gets me worked up. So I, on the other side of that, you, I, you know, this is something that just bothers me, right? So you've got the raise the wage folks that are coming out, and they've got you know they're pushing for you said ten ten an hour. Yes. Why in God's name are they not arguing for fifteen dollars an hour? That's what I don't get. I don't know. I mean, I think that's going to be something really interesting to see what we're going to get. You know, I, I think for too long, I think know, the 10, 10 an hour was an agreed upon is was it was something that was agreed upon for all members of the coalition. Yeah, that sounds to me like something that was agreed upon by some Democrats in a back room that say this is what we, we think we can get as opposed to an activist agenda that would really say, look, we're going to go for the fifteen dollars. Well, $15 I know like, an hour. Think that's about there are people of this coalition the fight for 15 is also involved in this. Exactly. So, you know, they're the ones pushing for fifteen dollars an hour in these meetings. Who's pushing for 1010 or something lower? Yeah, you got me. I mean, I really don't. I really don't get it. I, you know, I saw some. There were some studies that were that were done a while back. They were trying to that were looking at what the wage should be right now. If uh, you know, if you you roll it back to I don't know the '70s or whatever when it was a fairly high, and you kept the pace of inflation. And there's some case to be made that that dollar amount, if it kept pace with with inflation, was around like twelve dollars an hour. Right. This 10 10 thing seems like, OK, yeah, that's a huge, a significant boost to a lot of folks. Right. But, you know, you got cities and municipalities around this country right now. In the state of New York, for example, they're already kind of ahead of the curve on this stuff. So it seems to be strange that this this is kind of where where we got, you know, and I only say that this is not the knock the work of these folks. Like, I think they do phenomenal work. But, it, you know, I think that we're going to have to really start feeling our own oats and basically saying, you know what? 1010 is just not enough, right? We're actually going to have to go for a sustainable family sustaining wage, right? Which $15 in my mind is like at, at the baseline on that. But you know, you know, what do I know? <laughs> you done? Well, yeah, I'm done. Well, listen, and it took us right up to a break. So we're about to take another break here. And this is Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop. Uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes uh, to talk with Sean Kitchen uh, about our good old pal, the Trumpster. All right, we'll be back in a few. All right, we're back. This is Raging Chicken Radio, and this is Out the Coop, and we're talking with Sean Kitchen today. So, Sean, I'm curious, uh, what's your take on things going on with this uh, election 2016? Pretty nuts. Wow. <laughs> Donald Trump, really? You know, I remember... Uh, I would. I thought he wasn't going to make it to like past December, past January, and here he's going to take it to the convention, and he might have might have a shot at becoming the nominee for this for these uh, for the Republican Party. Oh, I think he's going to win. You think he's going to win? Yeah, I think he's going to win outright. 
Yeah. You know, and one of the things that actually just happened, it's kind of flying under the radar is what happened in Pennsylvania. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to dilute the pool, the candidacy, right, and try to take this to the convention, you're going to need as many people inside the race as possible to split up the del delegate votes in key parts of the country away from Trump, right? One right. of the things if, we're if, talking if, about. If, your game, if the game is a brokered convention, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a brokered convention. Well, one of the things that happened, it might shoot that in itself in the foot, is... Uh, John Kasich is not going to be on the ballot in Pennsylvania now because he didn't get the, the uh, enough signatures to get on the ballot for the Wait, you, April you're, tell, you're telling me you're telling me Rust Belt Johnny is not going to be on the state that he's supposed to win. Exactly. Right. One of the key important states. You know, this is like actually, you know, you looked at the polling that came out last month with uh, mm -hmm. Franklin and Marshall. Trump was at 22 percent. Kasich and Rubio were at like Kasich, Rubio and Cruz were all like. 15, 17, 18 percent mm -hmm. trailing right behind him. Now you just took Kasich out of the mix. It was at polling like second. And those votes are who going to go to who? Trump, most likely. You got to think about it. I mean, Kasich's running an anti Trump campaign, but the people he's talking to are Rust Belters. I don't see Rust Belters going for a Rubio or a Cruz type of figure. You know, Cruz is the evangelical Christian and doesn't really speak to white working class people. And Rubio is, you know, a stiff. No, I mean you, you take you take Kasich out of the mix, and I think you know Pennsylvania goes Trump easy, especially. I mean, and that, that's that's a that's a high not, high amount of delegates going to Trump in a winner take all state. You know that might that might possibly be the state to push him over the edge. Yeah, and get him to that uh, fifty plus one majority. Crazy, or stuff. it could be along. It could be one of the factors that gets him there. Crazy. What else we got on the wing nut fringe? Well, this guy Kasich, I did I t mentioned he was uh, endorsed by Scarnati. Who, uh -huh. uh, Senator Joe Scarnati, who is the Senate pro tempore, pretty much like number one or two in charge of the Senate. So he came out in support of uh, Kasich because of geography of Pennsylvania, how close it is to Ohio, and what he means to the Rust Belters, and guess what happened? Sorry, Joe. Not getting Kasich <laughs> on the thing this time. <laughs> yeah, I guess you actually have to have a political organization <laughs> on the ground, and just your, your endorsement is actually not going to do it. Yeah, and this is months after uh, everyone in the House and Senate supported Rick Santorum for president. Crazy. So so I wonder, I, I wonder who they're going to jump to next. Yeah, I know, and I hear that uh, Toomey's been flapping his gums too. Who? Who's Toomey. This guy? Toomey. Toomey. Oh yeah, didn't he say something like uh, he agreed with Trump that we're just a bunch of far left agitators? Yeah, what you I'm know, looking at Sol like the, the Solinskyites are coming back. You yeah, know, the same trope you hear every every time the election comes around. I thought this was crazy, right? That you had basically Toomey coming out. And he's basically saying the protesters at the Trump rallies are, quote, part of the culture of the far left, and they're potentially dangerous. And what I find remarkable about, about this with Toomey's comment, and I, you know, I really can't tell this is Toomey's attempt to spin what happened at the Trump rallies this past week or not. But, um, it, you know, what we saw with the violence that erupted on, on Friday when Trump canceled his uh cancel his rally in Chicago. Um, that was pretty incredible. And then you've got Trump openly coming out and threatening Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I mean, when did, when did you hear this kind of stuff? One presidential candidate threatening to send his people to Bernie Sanders rallies. And then over the weekend, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a, you know, this, this crazy group uh, that started and then stopped, right? But they were basically saying that we're going to start our own militia. And they call themselves, what was it, the Lion's Guard, um, and that they were going to go out and defend people, defend Trump supporters uh, against you the, look at the, the far like, left. Way, right, with, with Pat Toomey. This is like a second major miscalculation over the past few months. You know, first, he came out in support of not even voting, not, not even considering a vote, on who the next Supreme Court, Court Justice nominee is going to be. Right. That hurt him in the polls. Now he came out and said, yeah, they're just a bunch of far leftists. You know, it's the culture of the far left. These people are dangerous. And this is why you have someone like Fetterman who is doing well in the Senate race. You pretty much, okay, so like, it's a foregone conclusion. Sestak's going to be the nominee, right, at this point. You know, That's the guy what it looks like. He hasn't spent money on a single TV ad, and it looks like he's going to win the, can he's going to win the nomination. It's going to piss a lot of people off in D.C., you know, your establishment figures like Schumer and Harry Reid. Mm -hmm. But another thing is, look at Fetterman. Fetterman is polling right with McGinty, mm -hmm. which is either surprising on Fetterman's end or you look at McGinty's like, what what the hell is she doing? Right, right. I mean, she's not even running a campaign, and Fetterman's polling better than her in, again, when it's coming up against Toomey, which I find that to be ridiculous. I find, find it to be amazing, actually.
Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I'd love to see uh, Fetterman do well in this, be you know, because build a whole different kind of movement here in Pennsylvania in terms of uh, a political culture. Well, listen, we're just kind of running up to the wire here. So, uh, Sean, I'm going to bid you see ya uh, until we get together next week uh, for Raging Chicken, Dragon Chicken Radios out the coop. All right. We'll talk to you next week. See you next week. Hopefully we survive. You got it. Take care.